Hello and welcome to the Cuyamonga Institute, our Q&A Conversation for Exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education, and Outreach, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Cuyamonga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and supporting the rediscovery of the ancient practice of ecstatic transpostures. It was the insightful work of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman, who found the clues and revived the practice. She searched for the oldest evidence available, which she discovered in the world's collection of prehistory and indigenous art, and decoded these select artifacts as ritual instructions. And as an educational institution, we recognize the Thrive, we need to take an open approach. So we invite scholars of parallel research and related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. On these weekly Sunday discussions, we've included a full spectrum of topics from neuroscience and mysticism, trance states, anthropology, art history, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, shamanism, mythology, and much, much more. So you can visit our website at kuyamungainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we thank the community members who continue to support the mission of the Kuyamunga Institute. Far back into human history worldwide, we find the need to document our experience with etchings, drawings, and symbols. These petroglyphs on cave walls and rock faces were the oldest dating back as far as 40,000 years. Petroglyphs are a powerful cultural symbol that reflect the complex societies and religions of the surrounding tribes. Petroglyphs are central to the monument sacred landscape, which some traditional ceremonies take place. The context of each image is extremely important and integral to its meaning, and many have a supernatural context within the context of shamanism and documentation of their religious ceremonies. All of this leads us to today where together we're going to do a virtual visit to one of the largest petroglyph sites in the world, Rock Art Ranch in the southwest of the U.S. Laura, I'm jealous that you got to visit this site without <laughs> yeah. me, but next time I'm coming along. So please share a little bit more about your visit and introduce today's guest. This was an extraordinary site. So here in Winslow, Arizona, actually Joseph City, it's a little bit out of Winslow, and um, it's one of the world's oldest and largest collection of petroglyphs here uh, in Arizona. So quite the site. Because it's on private ground, uh, they have uh, granted permission to the Smithsonian, to universities in Arizona, um, in Chicago, uh, to come and really research the site. They've had field studies, they've had field uh, surveys done over uh, many years. They've done an archeological dig there, uh, counts of the petroglyphs. Why don't I narrate over some slides? And I think by that time, then Tori and Brantley will join us live. Uh, this is my little photo album of my visit. I want to thank our friends Earl and Susan for alerting us to this site. He's good friends with uh, Brantley and Tori, and he gathered up some uh, friends. So we had Bev and Dawn and Ray and Peggy. I only got the backs of the, I couldn't find a photo of us all together. Um, but here they are on our visit. And so we all um, motored out there one day, and here's what we saw. So, um, oh, they took a picture of me. This was in one of the Hogans uh, that is on the site that is still activated by a 115-year-old Navajo woman and her family. They come out uh, every year, and they conduct sweat lodges and, and uh, ceremonies out there. So it's long been a sacred site. So this is uh, what you see. They're giving you an alert of some of the major petroglyphs that you want to be sure to see out of the 3,000 uh, petroglyphs in this site. And uh, again, they date back some of them. I mean, there's years and years, millennia, of uh, petroglyphs added to the site. But this is what they're alerting you to see at the top of the platform before you go down. Uh, here's the ladder that takes you down into the canyon. Um, oh, this is my little video so you can get a good survey. So this is fed by a natural spring. So that's even all the more magical for this site. And I think it's um, almost a half mile 
of petroglyphs that are lining uh, one complete wall and then much of the second wall adjacent to this. And so you go down these stairs. I think this is the site of the original um, stairs that were carved in in ancient times to allow access to the canyon. This is the platform up top that Brantley has built so that you can uh, have uh, a little bit of a, I don't know, people lunch and view, view uh, before they go down in. Uh, this is a bridge that uh, helps you over when the water runs a little bit high. And so here you go. You can see some of the ancient uh, steps carved in. Uh, here's their, their sign. Of course, any private owner would want you to be responsible for yourself uh, and take, take your own risk going down. So here we go. And look at this. How serene, how uh, sweet this flowing water is to these sites. And there are just so many petroglyphs, 3,000 uh, petroglyphs that have been recorded and documented. This is one of the most famous, this they call the Cinderella. And so uh, look at these arms. We have postures with petroglyphs in these arm position. And uh, the skirt is of particular interest. They say it looks like the bear claw that you see nearby. So this, is, this bear claw is huge. And it is not on a vertical rock face, but it's rather in the middle of the canyon uh, on dry ground. And uh, so there's a, yeah, I think this is more toes represented than a bear actually has, but this is uh, such a beautiful. You can see that this was probably a natural feature that was augmented, just add some claws at the top and you've got a bear claw. And look at these um, sites, so whether these were pecked or etched or incised or pounded in. Um, there, look at this patina that you have, this dark patina and rather soft sandstone to etch. And of course, these were out there in the weather um, and the elements with erosion, with sun, with rain, with wind, um, and not covered like they might be with certain uh, rock, rock dwellings or rock faces or coverings but the air there is very dry. Um, this is in Arizona, not a lot of humidity. So a lot of anthropomorphs, human figures, a lot of zoomorphs, and a lot of uh, geometry. And look at this. It's something to go through this and see. You just have to let your eyes rest upon these to see all the various figures reveal themselves. So many. Um, oh, that's a little bit out of place. That's one of the sweat lodges that was built by the Navajo and still maintained. And look at this. Wow. So I just want to run through and give you a sense of the, um, the range of petroglyphs. Interestingly, this figure on the left where the arms are up and the feet are off to the sides, we did this the day before. We chose a petroglyph for our ecstatic trance posture um, experiential sessions. And this is such a highly energetic uh, petroglyph. And variants of this you see the world over. We have a whole collection where you see this same figure um, in various aspects, either legs together or legs out like this, and certainly hands up. And oftentimes the fingers shown splayed. Um, so we did that as one of our postures in our canon. And I want to also draw your attention to these three concentric circles. Um, just in the mid-range. And so we talked to Ken Zoll a while back, a few Sundays back, about the V-Bar V heritage site in the Verde Valley. And Ken was looking at the archaeoastronomy, which this is a known uh, calendar site, calendrical site, and um, noting that when the solstices and the equinoxes are traced um, for the purposes and this was with a sun dagger on the V-Bar V site, similar to the sun dagger site of Chaco, where the sun's rays activate these sites with a line, a shadow line, or a, a sunlight line, that he surmised, and he asked us, be aware when you see three concentric circles, because Ken Sol's theory is that this is a sign of a guild of sky watchers, of sun watchers, and that this is a very logical site uh, sign rather 
for sun watchers because it could represent the outermost, farthest uh, arc of the sun's journey across the sky from sunrise to sunset at the summer solstice where it's got the longest arc and it could represent the inner ring, the shortest arc during the winter. And then of course the middle arc would be the two equinoxes. And then you say, okay, that explains the rainbow, uh, the top arc, but it could also be the bottom arc, the completion of the three circles would be overnight, the sun's journey overnight uh, that we don't see. And so I've always been on the lookout since Ken alerted us. And so I'm pleased to see that even here, um, at the Rock Art Canyon Ranch collection, you see these, this same petroglyph, the three concentric circles. So that's exciting. So here on this uh, image, we have both the uh, figure that we use as a ritual posture, and you have the Guild of the Sky Watchers, uh, possibly. So here, when, we were, when I was there that day, there were other filmmakers there out filming. And so, uh, I don't know what film or what documentary this showed up in, but that's what they were uh, doing. It was nice to chat with them. And here you see all oh, these interesting figures with the antlers or the horns. We see that a lot in petroglyphs and artifacts. Uh, look, two antlered creatures, two deer, antelopes, facing each other. These starbursts, who knows uh, if that's an astronomical symbol or a celestial body. Sometimes you don't know if it's an actual artifact uh, of nature, an artifact of a petroglyph. Uh, this is what the, what the hills look like. This was uh, across the river, across the stream. Look at this. Is this uh, man-made or not? And then some of these you see, were they half and half? Half nature, half obviously these little figures on the lower left. Uh, and look at this one in between. Yeah, look at the zigzag of the snake up there. Uh, and Kenzo paid particular attention as well to the heritage site of the zigzag. He said that this, for him, tracked part of the calendar. So whether this was an astronomical site or not, uh, that, hasn't yet, that has yet to be determined. But that I'm seeing similar to what we saw in the V-bar V and how Ken explained it. This is another uh, angle to look at the bear claw in the middle. And look, more snake signs, more a whole collection of these uh, anthropomorphs with their arms out and their kind of uh, trapezoidal torsos, highly decorated with geometric signs. So, yeah, look at these, some are holding hands. Another close up of that, just extraordinary. What did these mean? What is their purpose? Interesting also, we see a couple of dots across the middle. I don't know if those were pecked in to hold scaffolding or hold a platform or a roof of some sort. I know Tori and, and uh, look at this uh, more uh, zigzag but more rounded at the top. I don't know if Tori and uh, Brantley are ready to join us. I think they're still logging on. But I want to just uh, quickly go through my own collection of slides and they will then delineate the meaning of some of the key ones. So obviously, some of these are picked in. Don't know about all of them or what they mean. It's such a mystery. Oh, look at this. Look at the eagle. Uh, it's hard to see from this angle, but you see the eagle with his talons, his wings spread. Such an unusual position uh, for an eagle to be shown. Maybe he's drying out his wings. And look at all the other zoomorphs around him. Oh, and look at this with the, the zigzag with the tail on this. Yeah. Uh, and here's a, a geometric sign in a pyramidal shape. And look at this figure. More the zigzag and geometrics. This is interesting because this has a very different feel uh, than the others. A spiral. It'd be so interesting and I'm sure people have compared the same symbols across the world 
to see if they're shared are these some kind of a, a language, some kind of uh, pictograms as well. These aren't painted, they're not pictograms, these are petroglyphs pecked into the rock surface, but still. And look at this. This is this is called the uh, birthing. So is this something being released in birth? Or is this the mother of the animals, mother of all game? There's a later picture where you see so many zoomorphs around her. And look at this geometric with the incised lines and again the uh, the arms up and out in that uh, posture that we did. You can see the hands and fingers splayed in this figure to the top right. Uh, is this somebody drumming or dancing in the middle? Is this a counting mechanism? Yeah, look at the hand, the hand shape. That's unusual in petroglyphs to see a hand like that. You certainly see it in uh, paleo art on cave walls, and look at this figure with the triangular chest and uh, arms out with delineations. Uh, the decorated torsos with the geometric lines, you see that widely, and the dots in one. Oh, one hand down, one hand up like this, and the figure to the right. Uh, this is uh, Tori and Brantley. So when you just pull up at the Rock Art Ranch, uh, you come here and park. This is by one of their barns that they've converted into a museum that holds a lot of collections, including a very brilliant, uh, beautiful, uh, and rare pot collection of pots Brantley found since he was a kid. And uh, Tori gives the tours to the rest of the ranch, but Brantley is uh, giving the tours of this. They have the petrified wood, because there's a petrified forest nearby. Um, and this is Brantley. I like the way they've decorated their entry door in his museum. He's the real deal. He's a real deal cowboy and so charming. You're going to enjoy meeting him and hearing his stories. And Tori's just a vibrant, uh, vibrant tour guide. And look at these pots. I'm going to wait and ask him to uh, tell us about these pots. Um, but these are, look at this collection, look at the spirals on the pots from the rounded spirals across to the more rectilinear spiral in the middle, uh, unusual artifacts. So he gave us a demonstration of this. So. Oh, look at the old pot beds. <laughs> Um, utilitarian pots to the highly decorated pots. The hole in the center was the deactivation of a pot. Um, this was probably not a ceremonial pot because it's so plain, but maybe a cooking pot. These are the highly decorated pots. Look at these symbols and signs. Just beautiful. Oh, and the mugs. We saw those at uh, Mesa Verde as well but just like we use today. And look, the, the cup and the mug, side by side. And the spoons, the ladles, uh, they has, he has a nice display of the arrow points and uh, stone tools. Huge ladle, look at that. That had to be for some ceremonial potion. Um, bones that were there. And he also has a collection of the old trucks, which are fun. I know you would love that, Paul. And uh, hats, got to see the cowboy hats. And a pioneer wagon. So there's a lot to see uh, at his museum. So that's the end of my slideshow. I think they're ready to join us. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Welcome, uh, Tori and Brantley. Sorry for the uh, roughness of getting online, but we're glad to have you here today. Glad your internet gave us this much. Yeah, so they, they're going to go right into their slideshow. Okay. Thank you for holding on to us. So um, just a little bit um, on the ranch here. So Brantley, he is um, my grandfather. He's been the owner of the ranch since 1945 is what we've done here. Um, Grandpa, do you want to share a little bit where your uh, mother and father met? 
my mother came out of Missouri. Uh, her uh, grandma and grandpa were Cherokee Indians. And she came uh, to Arizona, worked at Tonto Basin under the Tonto Rim down here at that little grocery store. <clears throat> my dad was on the sheep trail. They, they used to trail their sheep from, from Northern Arizona down to Dobson Ranch there in Mesa. And uh, that's where he met my mother was at that, at that little grocery store, and that was in the 30s. And, and where they had that when, uh, when they were on the she trail, then they had moved up from Mesa up to Sholo, Arizona. Um, that's where my grandfather went to school, right? And your mother did. So. Actually, my brother and I was born on the sheep trail. We was there, uh, Dobson Ranch, out, just outside of Mesa, Arizona. And that was in the, in the uh, 30s. We had our home was up by Sholo and my brother and I, uh, I was five and he was seven. That little old schoolhouse was still standing there in Shumway. They preserved it. And we rode over that hill five miles wow. in uh, Shumway and we tie our horse up all day and uh, go to school. And then we'd ride home at night. I was five and he was seven. And I look at these five-year-old kids now and Hell, they just seem like they're just barely out of diapers. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, a lot of history uh, in that country. Uh, anyway, uh, we left that country. <clears throat> we couldn't get to school in the winter because the snow would get up around the horse's belly. Back then, it seemed like we had more storm, more snow than we do now. Huh. We we come. Uh, we left that country. And, uh, we had our trailer with an old tractor pulling it, and that's all we had, and came uh, to a little warmer climate. We, we brought everything we had, uh, which, of course, back then, hell, you didn't need anything much. <laughs> Times have changed so much, I, you know, it just makes you wonder, but uh, yeah. anyway. Well, once he had left Sholo, they ended up at Rock Art Ranch. The ranch now that's showing in the picture here um, is the museum where um, it used to be a, a sheep barn in the back there and then Brantley transformed it into a museum. So this is the museum now where everyone first meets on our tours. Um, all the petrified woods you see out front there um, come out of near Holbrook area and um, we brought it in there, Brantley, my grandfather here, made the display out front. This is where people can park up front here. And then we take you um, inside the museum. Um, this is a little bit inside the museum here. So uh, uh, this is where we gather here. This is where a lot of people come in to see, um, especially the pottery, which I do have pictures of, which I'll show you um, in the slideshow here. But this is where we gather to do our tours. But now we've set up where these um, tables are. We've put a movie together of my grandfather explaining the pottery um, oh. the circumstances of, um, you know, the pandemic and the virus and everything. We just kept people separated and feel more comfortable in the museum. Um, so we did put a little video together showing uh, what he talks about the pottery and stuff now where people can view that. But we were lucky uh, to get the actual Brantley giving us the tour and get into the rooms and uh, even demonstrate. So oh, we, we had a lucky day right. on the tour. Yeah. Right, you did get the personal tour. I did, yeah. So, I think I was uh, thanks to Earl. <laughs> so. Yes, and uh, in, the, in the museum that you can kind of see in the picture here, um, the artwork that my grandfather's done, as well as things that are on the walls, um, a lot of his saddles that he's had. Okay, so on the saddles here, uh, again, this is just what's been used on the ranch. His dad has used them. Uh, you want to talk about the like the covered wagon? We actually, um, Brantley, my grandfather, made another museum in Joseph City with oh. some of the old historic stuff now, too. So he moved the covered wagon, but do you want to tell? We built a museum right on old Route 66 mm -hmm. in Joseph City, Arizona, between Holbrook and Winslow. And I spent three years in there putting that together. We, we took a lot of our stuff that we had outside at the ranch and moved into town so our kids and grandkids in the future can, can go in and see this stuff. And 
it's it's basically pioneer stuff yeah. Yeah. from the branch. But anyway, it's just a little history, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> time. I don't understand this era time. Okay, and now I'll click on this one. Maybe I'll just have to do each one. Oh, what a cute photo. That's you, Brantley, at 11 years old. Oh, my. <gasps> and where was this? Diapers there. <laughs> you found that pot at 11 years old. Yes, this was him when he found his uh, first pot. This, um, unfortunately, this pot isn't in um, the museum. It is shattered, but... Um, on the on the picture here we do have this picture in our museum as well but um yeah this is him with this pot you want to tell him where you well, yeah where'd you find this when you leave the ranch on an old horse i don't care where you're going you always keep your eyes open for, for pottery pots and arrowheads and stuff them people lived everywhere in this country at one time and and this here i'll bring a bunch of cattle across from the canyon into the into the ranch and it had blown out of a sandbank. Oh. That's the way it looked. It just sitting there, and and uh, yes. that's the way we find our Indian stuff after wind blown, after uh, washed out of the bottom of a canyon. You just never know where you're going to find it. Them people lived everywhere in this country, and I don't know where you folks are at, but. Uh, I talked to people from all over the United States, and at one time, I think there was as many people of them as there is today, the Anasazi people. Yes. Uh, they everywhere. Perfect. Let me just go back here. Um, and this one here. Uh, oh, more pottery. Oh, my gosh. Look at the, the, the art there. And that's in your museum, I think, in your pot. Yes. Oh, yep. This is um, at the museum. Um, that's where you will go in. People go in to look at the pottery. Um, this again, this all the pots that you're seeing in these pictures are found by my grandfather when he was uh, around 11. I mean, throughout the years and things. Uh, but you can tell all the different designs. They're so beautiful and so different. Yeah. Oh mm. gosh. Mm. And I know that you've had visits from archaeologists and researchers from around the world because it's such a fascinating, unique place on this planet. And they must be stunned when they see these 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 this pottery and, and the things that you've collected. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my grandfather also we hosted the University of Arizona for six years, and they six weeks out of each summer they did a field school. So on the picture of all the pottery that's scattered everywhere, they've brought it in closer for people to see it on the ranch. Um, we they also did find some. Pueblos, kivas, pit houses, different things like that on the property. Um, but with the scattered pottery in different sections on the ranch where the wind blows, I mean, constantly or reveals new things. But this pottery is just like this a lot of places on the ranch. Amazing. It's particularly valuable to archaeologists to have a site on private land where they can get permissions. Right. If it was federal land and uh, other other insta other it, it would be much more difficult to get the permissions, is my understanding. Now we're on arrowheads and pottery. Wow. Yeah, the ladles, the scoops. I mean, and one thing, too, you'll never see two designs alike. Out of all the pottery that we have on the ranch, we've never seen two designs alike. I mean, these people were magnificent in their designing. Um, I mean, nowadays we Google everything or we have someone who <laughs> we copy everybody's artwork, you know. Back then, they just did it all on their own. Mm -hmm. The depth of symbolism and, and unique uh, inspiration to themselves, the people, the culture, their ceremonies, their rituals, all of that. Uh, Brantley, you're getting a question from our chat room. Um, the desert climate helps preserve this, and they're wondering if you are still finding pottery on the, the ranch to this day. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, after a windstorm or rain, or under cliffs or ledges, when you're riding on an old horse, you just keep your eyes open, mm -hmm. and uh, you never know where you're going to find it. You know, it's they, like I said earlier; they lived everywhere, and and uh, it seemed like uh, when sometimes when they moved, if they uh, out of the area, they break break their pottery, or it's a rule they couldn't take it with them; they couldn't carry it. They were nomadic people, so they just a lot of times break it. And that's why you see a lot of broken pottery shards, especially where they had their 
where their pit houses were. And uh, Tori mentioned that we did a field school for the University of Arizona, also the University of Chicago. We had usually 18 to 20 students that came in and they stayed in them bunk houses and, and uh, we, we fed them for five weeks and, and they stayed right there on the ranch. And it was a lot of, we learned a lot from, from out of the book. And I think they learned a lot from us because we've lived with them. There's a place in Southern Arizona, Montezuma Castle, that I went down there when I was a kid. We played basketball down for Cottonwood. And we went, had a little time, so we went to that museum. They had two or three of them in the museum at that time. Uh, they call them mummies. They were just little tiny people. They were maybe four to five feet long. And uh, I went back about 15 years ago and that lady told me that they made them give them a proper <laughs> burial. So they took them out and, and buried them. But, uh, but they were little tiny people. Their teeth was wore out. They found in the, the front of the, their mouth. They, so they couldn't chew much. Their diet was terrible and uh, no doctors. They didn't have much going for them. Now the Navajo people, when they came in here, they weren't, uh, they were not the Anasazi people. The Navajo people are the, or came later. They had it made. They had domestic animals. They had their sheep. So they had milk, meat, and wool. Anasazi people folks had nothing, literally nothing. Mm. And you still have, I think there's a 113 year old uh, Navajo elder who still comes out and uses your sweat lodge that's on your land. We got to also tour your sweat lodge and an old Hogan. Tell us about her. She's an old Navajo, Navajo lady that uh, we have every year what we call an old geezer's party. You gotta be as old as dirt. <laughs> she, she, she's there every year. We didn't have it last year because of this damn virus or whatever they call it. But yeah. anyway, she was there uh, three years ago. She's 100, 115 years old. She lives on the res. And I talked to her boy here two or three days ago. She's doing pretty dang good. Wow. So it, your, your, your ranch has long been a sacred site. We see the evidence through all the, the petroglyphs and the ceremonial um, relics. And it still is. It's still activated. You still invite the elders to come and use the land in this way. So that's beautiful. So this is our entryway. Um, this is the only natural way throughout all of Chevalon Canyon. It's spelled C-H-E-V-E-L-O-N, Chevalon Canyon. So this is the only natural way that those people could get in and out of the canyon. As you can tell, we've added a white handrail um, down. That's a handrail that we've added for helping people and their access to get down. But it's a natural way. Once you start going down, you can see the natural toe holes where the people climbed in and out of the canyon. And through all of Shoveling Canyon, it's a massive canyon. And But where we're at right here in the canyon, um, it is spring fed about five miles up from the entryway here when you go down. So it's good, clean water um, the year round. Um, so do you see the old footholds in the canyon wall? That's where you put the, the staircase? Uh huh. That, and we also have a keep off sign where the big, the bigger ones are, where you can see where they used to climb right out. So we just put a keep off sign to try to keep um, oil and different things off. You know, much as pristine. Yeah. Because they say that hands are the biggest cause of damaging to petroglyphs. I mean, yes, obviously with vandalism, but in general, just oil in your skin will damage the petroglyphs. They say it's the biggest. So. Wow. Now, the petroglyphs in the canyon, folks, uh, we've had that it's on the National Red Store, historical places. It took us five years to get it on there. We, we had usually about 15 archaeologists down there for, for five weeks. And uh, uh, they claim some of the petroglyphs in the canyon are 7,500 to 6,000 B.C. That's like 9,500 years ago, they claimed them people were in this canyon. Now this canyon, they didn't live in it because they voiced right on down and out. It's it wall to wall. When it, it comes clear off the mountain, it runs clear down into the little Colorado River. So 
But the way they they car they carbon date the black, the patina, which is in the in the coconino sandstone, and they can carbon date it, and they claim seventy five hundred to six thousand BC. Who knows? That's like ninety five hundred wow. years ago, but, but that's soon can... after the end of the ice age. Wow. Yeah, that's what's so mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a beautiful oasis in the middle of a desert. So. Oh yeah, the Cinderella. Yeah. So tell us about the Cinderella. Yeah, she's one of our most popular petroglyphs down in the canyon. Um, we do call her the Cinderella. That's just our name for her. As you can tell, um, her she has a bear paw as her dress. Um, so it's upside down. And um, with that, they call her also the Hopi princess because Hopi is bear paw, is their tribal symbol. So that's what we can just kind of link it to a little bit um and you can tell there's a little man off to the side here but this whole rock in general is covered in petroglyphs but she's our most popular and uh, one of the biggest ones in the canyon well she's unusual in that isn't she yeah, yeah she's beautiful um i can try to make this one here um more of the families are around the canyon so um on the families you've got like obviously the men and then there's like a deer um, the little boy, obviously, that's like the other guy waving, kind of. <laughs> it's kind of just a lot of fun panels. And a lot of people ask, do you have meanings on each one? And we don't, but there are quite a few um, in the canyon um, on the National Register. It is claimed that we have over 3,000 petroglyphs down in the canyon. Um, this is Brantley here um, pointing out. Um, one of the things, this was from the Sunset Magazine, um, which we've been featured in. Uh, Brantley was also featured in the National Geographic in 2019. Um, they rated him one of the top 100 oldest sites in the world um, with that. It's, we've had quite a few um, people. So um, your, your collection of petroglyphs there on your land is one of the oldest and also one of the largest collections in a single site, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, wow. most people have um, never seen such a large amount of petroglyphs. And the nice thing kind of about it is, is it's not just, uh, you know, there's a lot of different places where you just have one gigantic rock and they're all on one rock. Like mm -hmm. this is a whole, it, the whole distance walking to see all of these petroglyphs is a half a mile. Mm -hmm. So the, it's about a half a mile long to see all of these petroglyphs and they're all over. And the one that's displayed here is the birthing scene. Um, this is what everyone comes to see. Um, she's very special. She's very, um, unique. Um, she is the lady giving birth there on the wall. Um, most birthing scenes are pretty tiny. She is probably a length span. I mean, she's pretty big up on the wall. And so she's what brings a lot of our people and especially, um, a lot of the archeologists and things to come see her. And some people call her the mother of all animals because there's so many zoomorphs and, and animal figures around her, too. Yes, yes, there yeah. is. Lots of them. And it's interesting that she has these circles down her her central axis, yeah, almost like, like the chakras, like you could say. Like Cupu yeah. Are those cupules where the rock has been ground out in the center? Yes. Wow. Even more special. So there was a ceremony that was activating this petroglyph and oh, during the grinding of, away of those cupules. Wow. And what do we see here? The, the, the eagle. I don't know if you can make out the eagle. Here's the wings and the beak and the feet. Yep. That's yeah, you see him from the side. Um, and and on the so on the left hand side, you've got all the animals. You've got a bunch of deer and elk all the way up the canyon wall there. And then obviously the biggest display of the eagle there. Um, but obviously, like, it's beautiful. And that's a lot of the things too. you'll see um, in Native American cultures and things where they'll dance in eagle feathers, or they will dance in different cult of uh, different feathers of animals and things. And so the eagle, though, you can, in his wings, he's beautiful. The way he it's does. also a very unusual depiction and, and perspective of the eagle, isn't it? You don't yeah, really see is. side views like that with a wing spread. Like that. The that's... black, you see, uh, the shiny black, that's what they call a patina. Yeah. That's where they etch the petroglyphs into the patina. That's a, it seeps out of the coconino sandstone. 
And that's, that's how they carbon date that. And that's how they get it come up with 7,500 to 6,000. I, I don't know yes. how. Wow. Yeah, but that patina is what absolutely protects that petroglyph. Because if we didn't have the patina, it wouldn't protect them. Uh, and we're super kind of blessed where we're at. Because I know a lot of people are joining us from all over. Um, but we don't have humidity. <laughs> so these this would not last, this Coconino sandstone. It would basically melt is what it would. It would not last on these walls. And we're super lucky, too, because the way that the snow melt comes off the rim, that's why we are closed January, February, March, and April because when the snow melt comes through, it runs high through the canyon, but all these petroglyphs are high enough up, the water doesn't touch them. The only one it touches yeah. is the Cinderella, but um, we're lucky because the water just doesn't damage them at all. Wow. And look at the huge antlers on this uh, deer to the left. That's, oh, I mean. Yeah. Like an elk or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, right? It's, he's beautiful. <laughs> I love them all. <laughs> If it was cave art, I'd say it was the giant elk oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is just uh, my grandfather being interviewed here. Um, we had ABC Good Morning Arizona. Um, we actually just had the History Channel a couple weeks ago. Um, again, we've just had so many people, especially the herd and the Smithsonian Institute. They come just about every year bringing people um to see the petroglyphs to see the pottery um obviously especially to see the dig sites where um the kivas and everything are as well uh, but this is up top where this is being filmed up here um this is where people eat lunch up top here so you're overlooking the canyon so most people on the tour will bring a lunch um or snacks and enjoy the afternoon up top there it is completely shaded uh, my grandfather actually built the veranda on a ladder when I was younger. Oh my! Uh, I can't. Well, go. we first of all, we feel very uh, pleased that you included us in your busy schedule, and uh, also uh, Brantley. Your <laughs> part of the charm is just meeting Brantley. So. He's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the picture here, this is just kind of a random photo I thrown in here um, because I could not download the one from the Pony Express, but. With the horse here that's displayed, my grandfather does commemorate the Pony Express. I don't know if any of you have heard the pony about the Pony Express. If you want to, yeah, do you want to explain it? This is out of Holbrook, Arizona, and we ride to Scottsdale for that big parade in Scottsdale every year, and it's like uh, 200 miles. It's one of the longest Pony Express rides in America. Oh, um, wow. A rider usually rides one mile and then they pass the mail to another rider and and they pass it. that's the way we we go uh get the mail uh, people like just to say that mail got carried a phone express i don't know what the big deal is but that's what they say <laughs> So people write in letters from all over to have it stamped because it is delivered by horseback. So the riders go to all the local schools around here, Holbrook, Winslow, pick up mail through Flagstaff off the reservation. Kids write in letters to all their friends, family members. Then they take it and they stamp it by the Pony Express. It gets put in bags. So here my grandpa was just training for the Pony Express in the picture. It's just at our ranch here. Um, but they have bags of mail and they will deliver it off to the next rider. And they start in Holbrook, Arizona at the courthouse. People come for miles and line up on the road and wave them off. And then the halfway meeting point is Payson and then into Scottsdale, Fountain Hills area there. And then um, it's pretty a historic event. Mm -hmm. um, the Hash Knife Cattle Company, you want to tell them what it was? Well, uh, that's the way they used to carry the mail years to go through this country is by horseback. And uh, uh, th that's that's just kind of the story. They That's the only way they could get it there. And it's just a kind of commemoration of, of what them old timers done. And we've been doing it for 60 years. Now. Well, 64 this year will, will be wow. Um, I just kind of posted the map here of kind of where we're located <laughs> uh, just to give people um, an idea where we're at here. Um, so on the map, you can see it's a black square where it says Chevalon Canyon Bridge there. A lot mm -hmm. of people come from Winslow area. Most people stay at the La Posada 
Um, they really rough it there and then they come and rough it at the ranch, <laughs> but the La Posada uh -huh. is a very historic, beautiful hotel. A lot of people stay at, then they come to us out of Winslow. The Chevalon Canyon bridge is the second oldest bridge in the state of Arizona. And um, it's a one lane bridge and they finally put up like railing on it to go over it. Like for the longest time, it was just a flat boarded bridge. Now it's actually metal. <laughs> that you can go over and that bridge is over the canyon where you'll go down and see the petroglyphs at but it's kind of fun a lot of people stop there and get pictures before they oh, come to it's the gorgeous canyon. even that uh section of the canyon so that's the same canyon that you it just go over the, the bridge canyon. okay yeah. um it's a very uh, again it is a very large canyon and then our canyon does draw mm -hmm. it out into um the little colorado is what okay. eventually sprouts out a lot of people will go to the petrified forest or the meteor crater we do highly recommend the walnut canyon or the grand canyon it's all there's so much to see on this little route 66 right here and it's all connected through the i-40 there so um between the grand canyon um and coming down towards us and obviously the petrified forest and the painted desert is beautiful as well Another little secret um, hidden gem in Arizona. It only happens though when we get rain. But if you ever want to look it up, um, it's called the Grand Falls or the Chocolate Falls. Those they are in the middle of the reservation, and it's some of the most beautiful waterfalls you'll ever see. It's mud coming off the falls. Oh. And they claim them to be as tall or as bigger as than the Niagara, and people come from all over to see them. But it's in the middle of the reservation there, but just to kind of, if you're ever in the area, to put that on your bucket list because it's beautiful. Oh, that Fabulous. would be extraordinary. Yes. So, so I see this at the end of your slideshow. Can we um, see you and chat with you for a little bit? And I know I have some pictures of the pots. So if I go back to my slideshow, then maybe, Brantley, you could explain some of the function of some of the artifacts in your collection. Uh, and then can we see you? Okay, so. and, uh, you know, I gotta go down and put you on camera here. Okay. Who's these two handsome ladies? <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time I've referred to you as a handsome lady. <laughs> I'll take that. I deserve it. <laughs> okay. Brantley, it's a pleasure to talk to you. know, in this world of uh, we don't get to talk to many real cowboys. Yeah, I was gonna say there's a lot of ranchers. a lot of people who pretend the cowboy thing, but you're the real deal, and so it's a real it's pleasure, a pleasure to, to yeah. have access and to you. Tori, you're so enthusiastic, and you're doing such a good job for the family and for your granddad. Ta-da! Yeah, yay! Oh, yeah. So all right, so pleasure to see you. Hi. Both. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> We appreciate that. And uh, again, Brantley, it's a pleasure to, to meet you, even though it's only virtual at this time. I <coughs> definitely look forward to coming up to the ranch and, and, uh, and, and having an opportunity to, to say I hi. I got to. You were there that day. Uh, he our, missed it. Uh, we had a conflicting schedule. We both Usually we travel like always together, so it was a unique opportunity that Laura took advantage of, and I didn't get a chance to join in. But I'm coming back. I will be there. We drive back and forth to Santa Fe on a regular basis. From we're in, we're in we go Sedona, right through Winslow. Sedona to yeah. Santa Fe, so we go through Winslow a lot. So we would love to come by again and, and see your ranch and, and all of that. So uh, when you come, you don't have to bring a swimming suit. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you fo city folks ever heard about skinny dipping. I remember skinny dipping in the 70s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it changed the name. It's Chunky Duncan. No more skinny dipping. Chunky Duncan. <laughs> Chunky Duncan. That's a new one. <laughs> so. All right. Well, did you want to share some slides? Well, let's have some questions first. Oh, okay. Any questions? And um, then I would like to share some of the artifact slides that yeah. I have. Well, so ask well, your questions now, comments. We're taking them. Um, well, that, you, let me see. So. Tony said... Are the reasons for being there, for example, hunting game, presence of water, other burials, signs of warfare uh, at the site? Are you asking just like, do we hunt on the ranch or are you asking about the people hunting? Like, no, uh, no, the no, it's the people. It's the, the people who were there before. Uh, oh. I imagine there was, there was game, large game even. And I'm wondering if that was part of why they would come. Um, I'm sure they had to a lot of game they had to eat something you know because they have no domestic animals at all and in the canyon there's fish they probably they probably eat that we have what we call indian rice grass which uh is just smaller than wheat cattle love it 
And I'm sure that they used a lot of that. They made their peaky bread with it. It's real, they make it real thin, just like paper. I don't know if you've eaten peaky bread or not. Most people have if they've been to La Posada. Uh, do, do the rock art correspond at all to, to meat animals? Um, there are animals out there. They're just a display. Um, there is a lot of the elk on display in the canyon. Um, there is actually a bear petroglyph. There's a man throwing an atlat at a bear. Um, there are sheep and there are goats on the canyon walls in the petroglyphs, yes. Uh, are, are there burials on the ranch? So in our, what we have when we did all of our, um, you, when we've hosted archeologists or had schools or anything, it isn't a contract that they are not allowed to look up burials or, I mean, that's not their main going after finding. Um, there's only one thing that they have ever found on the ranch and it was a little tiny um, baby skull. Uh, we hosted a little girls camp and they built a little monument for it. And then we had a Hopi man come and lay it to rest there. It would, they dated it 1500 AD, two to three years old is what they dated on the little skull. She'd washed out of a sand bank when we had a good rain. Uh, normally, in about one or two days after they wash out or they're uncovered, the coyotes will come along and eat eat the bones for the calcium or the old cows. We have to keep bones away from our cows. They'll get clogged up in their throat. So mm -hmm. it all has a little history, but, but as far as uh, excavating in any, no burial sites, uh, and, and never, like I said, now and then, if we hadn't have found her that day, probably two days later, she'd have been, coyotes would have had it. I see. Yeah. And so even cows eat bones. I know giraffes eat bones when they find them in the uh, nature, but they eat them for the calcium? Yes. You get yes. calcium? The cows yeah. aren't like the smartest animal on the planet. They'll probably <laughs> eat your car if they have the opportunity. <laughs> How many cattle do you have? Yours is a working cattle ranch. We run over 80 cattle, just about, we usually run anywhere from like 250 or so, but it's just been such a dry, we've been in such a massive drought. This rain this year, a little what, we got about two inches or so? Um, yeah, two inches between drops, one drop here and one over here. That's a two inch rain in this country. <laughs> <laughs> it's been so dry, so we just have not had we enough. We haven't had much. Grain or anything for the cattle, so we're really down on our numbers. We. We figure we have 5,000 acres on the ranch and we figure we can run six cows and six calves per acre to 640 acres. And like, that's even low, that's like our extreme numbers. So with 80 cattle, we're over grazing. So if that gives you an idea, it's pretty dry right now. Well, so it, um, even with the big rains in July this year, the monsoons were larger than usual, but that still hasn't made up for the lack of moisture it's just it's so late yeah. we need it like earlier we just needed a kind of more spring to mm -hmm. be able to produce for this fall it's just it's just late just because of calving season and how it works it's just a little late unfortunately sure. Sure. but your spring is eternal your your the stream that flows through your canyon is year-round yeah, water what a blessing there the canyon is always has water on it the year round but the only problem is is we don't drill from the canyon. We have our own well and units that we use on the property, but we cannot physically drill from the canyon, which again, we won't want to anyway. Um, go see. Do you want to go to my slideshows? Because I'd love to see more of the artifacts. And you did such a beautiful demonstration. So they're at the, they're at the bottom, they're at the end. So if you go back up. Okay. So, so um, Bradley, the, the, these were pictures that I took uh, from your, um, oh, you can just screen share from your demonstration in your museum of your pot rooms. Could you tell us what this is? Yeah, that pot right there, they call it tripod. It's used for ceremonial as near as we understand. It's just got, to, it's on three legs and it's, it's just, the designs, uh, you just don't understand what the designs on these pots mean. Everyone's different. You never see two designs alike. We've got over a hundred pots or more and there's not a, there's not two of them even close to hardly to be in the same. They're absolutely beautiful. Oh yeah, uh, look at all these. What do we see here? The History Channel, when they was here the other day, they said they could do one segment. I don't know what they're talking about, but one segment 
just on our Indian pottery. Hmm. We've got yeah. hundreds of beautiful pots. You don't find them all together in one piece like it shows in this display here. Some of them are broken and some of them are then put together. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're all different, every design. Look at all the spirals on this one. The one on the left, the one in the middle, the one on the right. A lot of And even this more rectilinear spiral in the center. Mm -hmm. And what is this reddish piece with the hole in the top, this kind of column with the hole atop? What was that? Like a spear straightener? What, do you, what is that? Just handles for the ladles. When oh. they have holes in them, if they don't, when they fire it, it'll break. They put uh, holes in them. That one there is just the top of a handle. Looks like it could hang it up. <laughs> I they see. Had purposes. They had a purpose for everything. Now you take here is a display of two different pots. One's laminate, and the other one's just a regular pot. The laminate is the ones that they used mainly for uh, cooking. Hmm. It, it wasn't fancy. It was just put together for service. Now the real nice ones with the nice. Uh, uh, direction of nice stuff that's painted on them is is more fancy. I, and and we don't know, folks, about this stuff. Nobody knows. You know, everybody's got their own theory behind it. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely beautiful, and 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 the, the Indian people, they're they're uh, a lot of art artists. They've got a lot of artistic value in their lives. Uh, it's just amazing. But like I said earlier, the don't get the the Navajo people and the Anasazi people mixed up because the Navajo people aren't the Anasazi. We are, you know. mm -hmm. in this country of the Anasazi is the Hopis, the Zunis, and the Apaches. Now, you get down to your country, down south, southern Arizona, you got the Pima, the Maricopa. They're they're the old people too. So you can actually see the burn marks from the from the pot. You can see that that was in a fire. This one in the foreground. Yeah. Oh, I have a I have one exactly like this that my mother found when she was a girl on her farm in Washington State. Mm -hmm. So, what is this tool? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what we call a tomahawk head. <clears throat> it's an axe, and uh, they what they do they take a, a cedar uh, or wrap around a uh, put a wrap wrap it with the rawhide, and it had a little handle on it. Mm -hmm. And it was a hammer. It was a, uh, all the tools they had, they made, folks. And you can see how it's been busted on one side, and it's kind mm -hmm. of sharp on the other side. That is a that, that is a Tommy Hawk head axe. And there's a shell necklace to the left, upper left. Um, so you even found jewelry, jewelry and and uh, ah and the tade. Oh, and look at this—a fire start. What it tell us about this? Well, now that is. Uh, that is a tool. This tool right here, folks, is is not authentic. A, a, a Cherokee Indian boy made this, and I wondered how in the world they got the holes in their beads and in, in the pots. This right here is the, the way they done it. it. It and also they used them for starting fires. Well, it's on the end of it's, it. It's absolutely beautiful, and it. I don't know if you folks remember. The old buttons we had when we was kids that you put a string on and you you could get a buzz and like this. Well, that's the way this thing. Turn it up, drop it down, and have you got a picture of it working? I don't have it. And, and that's it, it, just a drill is what it was. Wow. Yeah. So this would be um, that you work the handles. It goes back and forth fast. It creates friction. The point then would be on a piece of wood or a piece of shell to drill it or a piece of wood to start it smoking. And this would be a fire starter or a drill into something relatively soft, like a piece of shell or wood or something. Okay. And these are the beads that they made. Look at these. So they rolled the edges. They, oh, so much labor for all of this. And then in the upper, upper uh, part of the photo, that's a corn grinding or the matata stone, right? On a matat there that they used to... Uh... They used uh, two, the, two different types. And one of them was, had to be real, real smooth for the Indian rice grass. That's what they made their peaky bread out of. Now, when they was grinding corn, they would even have to pock up the mono and the matat in order for it to cut the corn. So uh -huh. they had two different things that they eat that we know of. And uh, uh, when 
and they ground. And that's the reason why their teeth was wore out. They eat probably a lot of sand every time they grind anything. Mm -hmm. The rock doesn't get mixed in and wear their teeth away. And here you are demonstrating that, that tool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it just kind of where um, this the string there kind of hangs down. He'll he'll turn it around and it will tighten up, and then you just go up and down with it, and it just drills. Yeah, mm -hmm. clever. Yeah. Laura, one thing that we did now is when you come back to visit us and anybody who does, we took the glass off the pottery. Oh. The glass is not there to cover any of the pottery anymore, so people can take a picture firsthand of it because so many people were taking pictures and it was a glass glare. So mm -hmm. in the photo here um, to the far, obviously right there, that's a display of pottery and we put glass over it and it's not there anymore. We took it all off so people could see it firsthand. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. Also, Brantley, you said that you've seen the little people. Do, do the ancestors speak to you? Do they show up to you in any way, living there and being so close to the culture? He said that he doesn't know if he connects as well as most people would. He yeah. that he's not as, as spiritually connected. I think, uh, well, just yeah. down in the canyon, when people get down there, you know, we hear a lot of people are like, it's just so beautiful and spiritual. You know, I feel like a lot of people, different places have their experiences, and I'm not comparing it to a war place or like Pearl Harbor or um, um, the other day. I mean, every place that you go kind of has like a the Arlington Cemetery, like every place, you know, has some type of spiritual place or feeling that it may be. And that's what I get from a lot of people. It's it's a different kind of spiritual of where you know that those people spent hours down in the canyon. Um, like my mom, for instance, when she was growing up, she'll, um, that is my mom, uh, my grandparents' oldest daughter, my mom, um, she would say like, she always felt like people were looking over the edge of the canyon kind of when they would go like, you know, be down there. And she just felt like, the people is just a spiritual and active place where they spent a lot of time and mm -hmm. on, on the petroglyphs i mean it's their it's their story it's their lives and i'm just grateful that we're able to preserve it i and especially with irene someone who's 115 years old i mean when you come in contact with her you're seeing someone who has seen everything a vehicle a cell phone for crying out loud, anything like that you know it's it's a total different world to her. So when she does something like her sweat house, where she's just so spiritually connected, fully Navajo, when you see someone like that, she's a very spiritual person. She asks, I mean, that's just how she is. Now over in the canyon, folks, uh, it's peaceful and quiet. Put it that way, the water's running down through the canyon. It's green, it's a beautiful place. And that's the spirituality that I get. It's just so peaceful. Uh, other than that, I haven't I haven't seen nobody coming in and out. <laughs> it just if you sensed it in any way was was the question. Not seeing if it sensed it, but I I can imagine how magical it must have seemed to those ancient people to have water just spring from the ground. How springs have always been so um, honored and held sacred. It's just a gift of nature that just comes out of the ground. So well, one thing in the middle of nowhere, once you arrive to the ranch, a lot of people are amazed. They're like, this is in the middle of nowhere. Like and mm -hmm. when people, when we get a phone call, when someone's lost or something, they'll be like, you know, there's no stoplights. There's no, well, we are truly in the middle of nowhere. That's why GPS usually, uh, you know, takes you to our mailbox. When people put Rock Art Ranch, it does take you to Joe City where we get our mail and they'll be like, we're at the post office, you know? we are truly in the middle of nowhere. So when these people, you know, at the ranch where we're at, where that water stream is, it's almost like a blessing because it is in the desert. It is in the middle of nowhere. You would never suspect it. So that's why so many people live there. When I was taking classes, you know, sitting on the U of A, um, they would talk about different things of water and how water you have to have it to survive. They said water over food. And one thing though, with the people like saying with the matates and grind rocks grinding out their teeth, they taught us that these people ate anywhere in their bodies when they measured out ate anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds of sand. And that's a lot of sand. If you think about it, you're sleeping in it, you're grinding it up in your rocks, your matates, you know, you're breathing it. Yeah. You're drinking in it. It's in your pots, right? So in our storage units where the U of A did their field school, where they're deep down under the storage units, 
where those pots were, they're just filling up with sand. So it's in your food, it's in your water, but you're keeping it cold. But mm -hmm. 10 to 15 pounds of sand, that's a lot of sand in your digestive system. Wow. And if you're only four feet tall, 60, 70 pounds, there's not much to you. <laughs> Got it. Wow. Well, they, they didn't live in the canyon, but they certainly lived there on the, the land. And so your archaeological site showed what pit dwellings, um, fire, what, what, what did you all see that they excavated? The kivas are the place of worship. They're down low. And that's what um, a lot of like when the archaeologists love to come and see, it's just where they walk down low. It's a place of worship down below. And then up top is their homes that we have. Um, the U of A left everything is original. We built a building over it to preserve it. Um, Dr. Chuck Adams, um, a lot of people may have heard of him. He's done a lot of work at Hamalavi. He's done a lot of work, a lot of different places. He's hosted a lot of field schools all over the world. Um, but he claims the one that we just have on the property is like one of hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds of little homes. Our biggest problem with preserving is where it's at. We get about 70 mile per hour winds and it's just dirt. So we've lost the roof a couple of times. It's hard to preserve things. And if we didn't have that building, it would just fill right up with sand. So we put that building up. We have the three rooms that they have, the storage units that the people use. They did find, I mean, tons of pottery. They found wheat, corn, and cotton seed down in the storage units. Wow. Um, it, it's a really beautiful place that we're, we're happy to have. Cotton seed. So they were growing cotton. Interesting. If they built their pueblos, pit houses up on top of a ridge is for protection. They had to see who was coming. Now the kivas, where they worshipped, they built down where they farmed. They weren't worrying. They weren't so concerned about that. But they had to build where they lived right up on top of the ridge. And you can imagine a cold winter day when that winds are blowing. But that's the way they survived. That's the only way they could survive. Mm -hmm. uh, Christine Van Poel, archaeologist, we'd love to hear your uh, thoughts, comments. Hello. Hi. Excellent, excellent presentation. I enjoyed it a, a great deal. So thank you so much. And I hope to get out there and hope to not get lost. I work in parts um, further south to you in New Mexico and there's no GPS on our site. So I understand the, those challenges and I, I look forward to eventually seeing the rock art. This was excellent. And I don't have a lot of extra to, to add because it was so well done. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. I did see someone's comment, um, have the pots been dated? Um, they have been um, dated. You want to tell them the dates on the pot? Well, <clears throat> the pottery is near as we understand is 1200 years. Uh, before that period of time, everything they used was baskets. And they started uh, using the pottery and they liked the pottery better. So they stayed with the pottery. The Navajo people don't use the pottery. They didn't like the pottery. You see a little of it now, but that's kind of the story on the potter. Hmm. And so lots of good clay there, um, especially near the banks of the stream. And for basketry, what were they using? Yucca plant, another fibrous plant, so that grows there. So it's interesting how they... Yucca. A lot of the yucca uh, cactus yeah. plant is mm -hmm. what they use for their baskets. And that's, uh, and I'm sure... They brought a lot out of, that, out of the valley, the low country, you know, because we don't have a lot of it up here. We have the yucca. But as far as the what they use to make their baskets and stuff, uh, like I said, they I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised what a lot of them people was down in the valley in the winter and moved back to, <laughs> back to the, up on top of the mountain in the summer like our snowbirds do now. The first original <laughs> snowbirds. <laughs> They were a migratory people. I think that's just in our bones, isn't it? Yeah, to migrate, so. And Tori, what is your career goals? What do you do? How old are you? What what is what are you doing? You never ask a lady her age. Oh, I'm sorry, but she's so young and beautiful. <laughs> so, you mentioned going to classes at, at the University of Arizona. Uh, right. Are you gonna pursue this as a career? And Right, so, um, Obviously, Brantley and Katie are my grandparents. Um, Brantley is living. Um, my, my grandfather or my grandmother passed in 2016. My grandpa had um, four kids, um, 13 grandkids, and he's up to 27 great grandkids right now. Wow. And I have 13 grandkids. Um, I am fourth generation of Rock Art Ranch. I've been doing tours since I was a little girl. Um, 
We used to run tours a little differently when I was growing up. We used to have a man out of Payson come up and do our tour groups like Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. And we used to perform and play the harmonicas and have a cowboy supper. It was very ran differently. Um, but with the ranch of just working next to my grandfather most of my entire life, I did go to um, Dixie State University in Southern Utah by Zion National Park. I had got my bachelor's degree in not archaeology at all, actually. I just took, I would um, go in on Dr. Chuck Adams classes in the summertime off my time of high school and a little bit of college because at the time they had came, I was still in high school. Um, and then going off to college, I actually got my degree in journalism. Um, it has always, so I've done a lot with the archaeologists of just going through and seeing their databases. I've done a lot of work with them. Uh, but I have had my other careers. I have been a news um, anchor out of Southern Utah. I did news talk radio for several years. I worked for um, the Arizona Cardinals and I talked radio down in Phoenix for a while. So I did that. And then now I'm just back home. I was um, part of the Las Vegas mass shooting. Um, I was a reporter on the scene of that. And, to, and so oh. after that, I had decided to um, end down my career and come home <laughs> because after that situation, some things just are a little more important like family. Mm -hmm. And so I came home and I've been working with my grandpa doing tours. I do all the scheduling for the tours. Um, I am hoping uh, fingers crossed at some point we would love to put a book together of the ranch. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So well, I'm trying to get a book. It's just throwing up together. We're hoping in our off season, we'll have a little more time, especially this year. It's been rough, but like just working a lot at the ranch, um, just of circumstances and things. But so that's kind of what I do. I'm just his personal assistant is what I just call myself. And I <laughs> lucky man, friendly. Calls, send out emails, um, brochures. Um, yeah, a lot of people call all the time and ask just how to get to the ranch or ask information. And I try to do that for everyone. In other words, folks, she has her BS degree. Yeah, that's what I have. I don't know if you know what BS stands for, but uh, she has that degree. That's what I have. One other kid we raised, folks, uh, too, was a little Navajo girl. We had her for eight years. She lived with us. Her dad was a code doctor in the Second World War. Oh, man. Honeywell in Phoenix today. So she's a... She's a fifth one. Then we had one little German girl on the foreign exchange for a year from Kiel, Germany. So she's five, six. So we, <laughs> so we got six of them. So six kids. I'm sorry, not four. The adopted two. <laughs> yeah. Oh my! Well, what an idyllic childhood to grow up on the ranch and yeah. with the with the ancient history. Wow. Anything else you want to share with us? Um, I, I don't know if anyone has any questions yeah. of the ranch or how the tour works or if you want to know anything specific on the ranch um we do have um one pot in particular i know that a lot of people have heard about it um it is the square pot um so when it said any um unique pots um the square pot is what the herd in the Smithsonian come over to see every year they claim we're the only ones in the world with a square pot it's just very little um, but it has four corners to it unlike a round pot um, but that is what the National Geographic, a lot of people come to see. So when you hear someone say or mention the square pot, that is at. Do you have a photo of it? I don't have a photo of I it. I wish I did. I, you know, I was trying to find one for the slideshow and I did, I didn't even have one of it. I was like, of course the one pot, uh, but we don't. Um, I did notice that you have a pot or two that has the kills, the kill hole in the center. Do you want to talk about those a bit and why there's a hole in the, just in the center? This is a story behind this stuff. A lot of these stories, I'll tell you right now, every time they get told, they get a little bigger. So you just <laughs> believe what you want to. Okay. This pot with a hole in the bottom of it, according to the Indian people, when that lady that cooked with that pot died, they knock a hole in it. They claim that relieves the spirit. They say they do the same with their hogans, uh, the Navajo people, and then they abandon it. They never go back. So that's the story behind the the pot with a hole in it. It's a kill pot, they called it. Mm -hmm. They deactivate it that way. So um, mm -hmm. I know that for the VBRV and trying to heritage site, trying to decode some of the uh, many petroglyphs there, that they brought in the Hopi elders. 
and they would say, oh, these are our clan, this is this, what this is, what did you, um, or has anyone who has been there um, to re research your petroglyph collection, have they brought in some of the Hopi elders perhaps, or other ancestral lineage to help to decode them and their meaning? Good question. We have um, the Hopi Tribal Council. They bring usually a lot, some of their wayward kids that they're trying to teach to try to get back in their cultures. It, it is sad because it's just kind of like Irene, Irene, who's Navajo. I mean, her culture is dying pretty much off. I mean, she's on her 15. She's just trying to keep it alive. You can like her generations, like her daughter's 94 now, I think. So, you know, so she's like down to her seventh great, 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 great grandchild trying to help um, her and trying to keep it alive. That's why they come out and they do ceremonies or they mud at the Hogans that we have on the property. Mm -hmm. um, and but, with the Hope Travel Council trying to bring them in and, you know, they try to share stories with the pottery stuff and they're grateful to my grandfather of where it's at because my grandfather, we've never traded, we don't sell, we don't put in other museums and he lets them come and, you know, see it, you know, and they try to, he, we learn from them and they learn from us, you know, it's kind of like, I think how we run the ranch and then some of their history and, and learning from both sides, you know, it's great because my grandpa has such a great relationship with Navajo and Hopi people and that he's respected, which is huge because some people aren't and it could not be a good situation, but with my grandpa, he's hugely respected of what he's done and what he's learned from people, especially someone like Irene. So. Mm -hmm. And Irene, I understand comes on a yearly basis and uses the sweat lodge and yeah. conduct ceremony and Sweat house is her favorite. I mean, it's a very spiritual thing. Um, the sweat house is just very little. It's something designed for her height. What is she like a little over four feet? <laughs> I swear, maybe even under four feet. She's tiny. She's just a tiny little lady. And she'll go in and she'll, um, uh, we have a volcanic rock that she they'll use and they'll place it in there with the fire and let it die down. And then she uses water and she throws the water on the volcanic rock and it it's just steam and she'll close it off with the hide and sweat as long as she needs to. I mean, it's very spiritual to her. I mean, it's her way of a bath. I mean, you know, back then you didn't have a lot of stuff and then she'll use a bucket of sand on her body and scrub and it's exfoliation. It's just oh. totally um, uh, just natural. <laughs> So, and then Paul's going to show a, a picture of that sweat lodge. Oh, um, yeah. We got to go in it. I appreciate how much access your visitors get. So, we got to go see the Hogan, the sweat lodge. You took us out, Tori, to the covered excavation site. Of course, the, the museum and the ranch and the, um, even the covered wagon. And then, of course, the rocks, uh, petroglyphs in, in the canyon. So... Yep. I can tell you a little about the sweat house here, folks. That Navajo boy, we get the Navajo people back every about every six years or so to remud them up. That Navajo boy told me there maybe be three Indians in there at one time taking a, a, a sweat. They heat the rock outside, carry it in, pour water on it. It's mm -hmm. just a it's just a sign. Mm -hmm. And he said you go through four times. You go through for the north, the east, the south, and the west. And he said sometimes the older people when uh, they've been in there so dang long, you about have to drag them out. Mm. Uh, but it's a spiritual cleanse is what it is. Wow. I have a question. Uh, the rock art seems to be very high on the rocks. How did they reach to do all these things? Oh, good question. I, I don't know how. The, some of them petroglyphs are quite high up on the side of the canyon, like you say. I don't know. They might have had uh, some kind of a wooden ladder, some kind of a, a, I don't know, rope or something that they had made. They, you know, that's a good question. Whatever you say sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they dig in a stake and they take ropes and you kind of rappel down, and then all of them. I the most all of those petroglyphs that were in this canyon, folks. They had access to them by standing on a ledge or some way. Some of them they didn't, but but they were probably very nimble people and kind of like a dang mountain goat, you know, as far as getting around them ledges and whatnot, where we'd probably fall off the first day and break our neck. Uh -huh. But uh, anyway, you know, whatever you say, ma'am, I'll tell you, 
a lot of this stuff we don't know and we'll never know. I yeah. love about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just need to imagine. It is unique to imagine because I mean, you think what you're saying about the petroglyphs and how high, I mean, coming in by rope or a ladder, you think about that because in my mind, how am I going to get down these canyon walls? You know, how am I going to, you know, these people didn't have the internet to Google. How can I climb down a canyon wall? You know, <laughs> they, they came it up with on their own. We literally have done everything after these people. We eat out of a cereal bowl. They made bowls. We have ladles to get, you know, ice cream. They made ladders uh, to get down. We have ladders today. We literally have copied after these people and they didn't have a book to open up to like how these people were incredible to be honest. Yes. Do you find the square mugs, the mugs there that you see at Mesa Verde National Park? And they're, you know, they even had mugs just exactly like we would today. Yeah. And, and with a handle. Like, yeah. that, like who would have thought to put a handle for your hand, just like we have our coffee mugs, everything today. Yeah. yeah. And they make good cocoa uh, products out of it. So. Oh my gosh. Thank well, you. I will. I, if I go back to my slideshow real quickly, okay. there is a series I noticed as you just come down of, it looks like post holes in a line on the canyon, which have been the vigas, the ceiling braces for some, on some sites, that's an indicator of different stories that were built along the cliff walls. But I thought I noticed um, that. I was going to ask you about that. I know someone asked just, in the comments, is there any pictographs? And there isn't, no no paints or anything. It's just pets, it's just literally etched into the canyon. There's, yeah, there's no paint um, in the canyon. Yeah, so. So, so no, that is the bridge that you, we use in the winter time to get across in the water run high. <laughs> uh -huh. This long bridge right here. Um, is the why we shut down is usually when the sometimes the snow melt you wouldn't even know that bridge exists because the snow melt rush is so high off the mountain you wouldn't know it was there so good to close when it's a little dangerous there oh isn't that beautiful wow and there's fish that run there as well um oh this is interesting but what is the story with this whole these dots around this Circle. kind of quarter, the circle with the qu quadrants. Do you know anything about that? You know, ma'am, I have no idea. Uh... So we learned something quite interesting from um, a gentleman recently. Yeah, a... Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, you yeah. want to tell him? Yeah, well, go ahead. Well, uh, <clears throat> I had a Hopi, a Navajo fellow the other day. He said what the, all the paw marks on them on that, he said them ladies would get together and grind their their uh, corn or Indian rice grass or what they had together and visit. It's a community said, grinding yeah, stuff. Yeah, each one of them had had uh, their own uh, grinding bowl there. So look at that! Isn't that interesting? Like a being inside a being right there. We don't know, ma'am, for sure. I I imagine uh, just a rock. For Probably. tools, for grinding into the walls. Well, for yeah, just a tapping in, in it. That co that uh, sandstone is fairly uh, soft, and it wouldn't take. It don't take a whole lot to make a, a mark in it. It's just some kind of a rock, some kind of a tool that felt good to them, probably. Yeah. So. so you can tell, like on that ledge in the last picture that we were on with the man holding the camera. Uh huh. One picture back. Okay. Yeah, that's a beautiful scene right there. That's a hunting scene. You see a lot of animals right there and you see this, the yeah. sun. Sorry, we're going too fast back and forth, but yeah. yeah. So. No, no worries. Now, all the little different things, there's a lot of looking things too. A lot of people are like, there's like a lot of looking alien type figures with little antlers yeah. coming out of their heads. It's true. There are a lot of them. <laughs> that's the hunting scene. That's looking. the hunting scene. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the hunting scene is beautiful. Any thought on these kind of starbursts? Some people think they're astronomical indicators. We've heard that at other sites. Well, and then I'm wondering about um, nationwide or even worldwide, if there's some uh, symbols that mean the same thing. And we had that proposal from Ken Zoll about the three concentric circles being a sign of the sky watchers. Um, so the various arcs that the sun makes from sunrise to sunset 
um, and the distance covered uh, a large arc to a small arc, and then what would be going on um, at night, three concentric circles is a very logical symbol for it. And we saw one of these with you all here. We were looking at that earlier. Oh, so, and that's our family holding hands. I absolutely oh, yeah. love the panel off to the very far right, or excuse me, left, sorry. The very far left where the crack kind of is on the canyon. Well, you can see the big family holding hands. It's beautiful. I love the one of them holding hands. Yeah, mm -hmm. a family yeah. portrait. Um, I see a lot of people saying that um, the community grinding stone is a big thing through like California and different places. We've heard that quite a bit. It's, it's a lot of different places where the community grinding stone is in different areas or private property of people. A lot of people have found to get lots of community. How big stone. is that bear paw? So you could actually fit several women at once around it during yeah, the grinding? The bear paw rock is huge. I mean, we, I mean, we, it's, it's a good size of a round kitchen table. I mean, it's a pretty good size um, where the bear paw is. And when the sun's hitting it just right, it's pretty beautiful. And it's also in the center, so you can actually all sit all around it. It's not vertical. It's more, not quite horizontal, but it's right. accessible. It too, where you could sit up top and they could just easily talk and grind. Right. Yeah. And again, the eagle. Yeah, the eagle. That's a really good one. Laura, you took really good photos when you were there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was so thrilled to be there. Yeah. And look how they're pecking the body of this. And then, so you've yeah. got pecking, you've got abrading, you've got incising, you've uh, got the various techniques to, to etch. Um, I saw someone in the comments ask about how reservations or people can get a hold of us. Um, do the only thing, we don't have a website, just so you know, we only run on our Facebook page for Rock Art Ranch or for um, our phone number, which you can personally contact our ranch and we can give you information of how our tours works and things, but we don't run a website. So many people put websites together for us with their personal information and history and kind of their own views on the ranch, but it's not ours. The only thing we run is Facebook, just so you are aware of that. <laughs> and so has the traffic increased? I mean, you know, we, we saw in this part of Arizona, uh, because of the, the uh, the COVID thing, people not traveling out of the U.S., all of a sudden coming to all of the localities and in and, and, and droves. I mean, the amount of population and, and visitation has, has grown significantly. Did that happen at the ranch as well? Um, yeah, especially a lot of locals. I mean, we had more people out of the state of Arizona the past last year, especially for 2020, kind of when we had slowly reopened, phased opening into this year, more people from Arizona, probably more than ever before, because they were looking for something to do outdoors. Mm. And the only part where we meet is the museum for like about 30 minutes to an hour max. And then we're outdoors the whole rest of the time. So yes, we did increase. And then Obviously, um, the National Geographic releasing us in 2019, so it kind of was rough because it released and then it kind of went into the pandemic and then <laughs> so people were like, now they're kind of coming to us this more than ever this year since um, things have been released and um, more people finding out about us because I would say that on average, I mean, like we're not not like the Grand Canyon. We're not seeing thousands of people a day or hundreds of people, you know, we're seeing like four to six people here and there throughout the each day, you know, and then private parties. If you have bigger groups, we try to do afternoons to keep you separate um, from other people, but we're still, so we're still getting well known, but we're not out there yet, but it also makes it really nice because people get their own private tour and can enjoy these petroglyphs and the Canyon's not crowded. I mean, some of the biggest groups that I mean you're having is maybe 15, 20 people on like your biggest group. And but I mean, throughout the whole canyon, that's so spread out and you, we get to take you to all these places and everyone has their own personal vehicle throughout the tour as we take you to the few sites. So that way you have your water, your hiking stuff, snacks with you at all times. It just makes people feel comfortable and, and just enjoyable, really. We do recommend having a reservation. Um, we do reservations so that way we know how many people is going to be on the tour um, and that way we can send you a personal map and a confirmation um, text message is what we usually will send out to you um, but yes this is me and my grandfather in front of our ranch uh, my grandfather usually will greet people there and then i usually take them on for the rest of um, the tour and he answers any questions for people you may have um, 
Yeah, it's kind of what we do. We're not, again, it's just um, our little tours, how we run them. It's great. We get to meet you all from all over the world. We would love to have you all. Um, we have lots to see. And again, in the petroglyph site, there's no time limit. Um, we usually get there about lunchtime. And most people bring a lunch and can have enjoy the picnic facility and go down and enjoy the petroglyphs. Most people spend a couple hours down in there because, again, on the National Registry that we've been featured on, there is over 3,000 petroglyphs claimed in the canyon. And we're super lucky because none of them are damaged. Um, a lot of people ask us, is there graffiti in the canyon? Is there things like that? There's only about two places down in the canyon, one around the bend by the swimming hole, and it's not on a petroglyph, and one up top when you start to walk down that someone wrote in a date a really, really long time ago. Um, so nothing is damaged. All the petroglyphs are beautiful. And a lot of people ask, do you need binoculars? The petroglyphs, you can walk right up to them. People are, they're just like basically right in your face. So. Well, well, thank you so much for the visit. Really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you for all that you uh, do to help preserve the history and make it accessible. So. Yeah, Pri sometimes private ownership is the ideal way for a place to be preserved, especially with the right owners. And obviously, you've been the right owners and the right family to protect this and to, to make it uh, preserved for future generations. So uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you both and, uh, and uh, well, to hear your stories. Know. We tell them we're not the owners. Good Lord is the one that owns the dang place. We're there to take care of it. That's what we try to do. That's the attitude. That's the right attitude, and for Thank sure. You guys having Thank us, you. you guys are amazing. If you if you have um, any questions or anything, obviously you can call us or contact us on our Facebook page. We try to answer as many questions as we can, um, or anything like that. But. Thank you so much, Laura and Paul. You guys are the best. Great. Well, we'll see you <laughs> Thank soon. Thank you, Tori, for all the good work that you're doing. Bringing it to the next generation.